Colonization. When we think of colonies and colonial empires, we think of the past, with Europeans setting out into the oceans and finding out a whole extra part of the world they didn't know existed, settling there and claiming it as their own, exploiting the people and resources that lived there, and then fighting amongst each other over who got to keep which parts. As time went on, however, both the local people realized, hey, we don't want to be ruled by these occupiers anymore, and the colonizing powers themselves realized it was time to move on and grant these places independence. A few colonies got independence through their own hands earlier on, like Haiti, Brazil, or even the United States. Although we have to keep in mind that for the US, for instance, it wasn't the original natives kicking off the colonizers. It was the colonizers or their descendants wanting to break away from the ruling nation they originated from. Others and most old colonies got their independence in the 20th century, the vast majority after the end of World War II, although some sadly took longer to conquer or be granted their due independence. But what about the ones that didn't? Because not every place in the world that became a colony during the times of European colonization of the world are now independent, and some remain under the rule of other nations. So in this video, we're going to find out which countries still have colonies today, what those colonies are, and why they managed to keep them when all the other ones were able to fight for, claim, and ultimately reach their independence. Today, the countries we can arguably say still have colonies are Australia, Denmark, the Netherlands, Spain, France, New Zealand, Norway, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Oddly enough, three of these nine were former colonies themselves, Australia, New Zealand, and the US. But Australia and New Zealand's possessions still date back to European colonialism. They just inherited those domains as they gained further sovereignty from the United Kingdom. In the case of the US, they date back to the beginning of American imperialism and the desire of the US to expand outside their continental territory. However, we need to remember, the term colony is not really applicable anymore, and it's a original meaning would not be valid today. These aren't necessarily places where the ruling power goes to and exploits the people and resources to enrich the homeland. They are simply overseas territories that are under the control of a foreign power that is not that of the native slash local people, but where, other than self-determination, these people have the same rights as those who live in the country itself, at least in the majority of cases. The United Nations has a list of non-self-governing territories, which are defined as territories whose people have not yet attained a full measure of self-government. They list 17 places, but leave some key ones out, and I can't really understand why or what the criteria is. What's the logic of including the British Virgin Islands, but not French Guiana? Why is Western Sahara in it, but not Greenland? I guess it depends on how you want to define a modern-day colony, but I always thought of them as being more of overseas territories that countries have, which are the remnants of colonial times and are not integrated as a full part of their countries today. Let's go country by country. Spain needs to be divided into two aspects. I don't think it's fair to consider the Canary Islands as a colony. As far as I know, they were deserted upon Spanish arrival, and they are today completely incorporated as a part of Spain, in similar way to what happened with Madeira or the Azores for Portugal. And this is the case with many of the territories that European nations still control today throughout the world, as these remnants of their colonial empires. However, Spain has other domains that were previous colonies and which differ from the Canary Islands, the cities of Ceuta, Melilla, and other small plazas de soberania, essentially the remnants of Spanish possessions in North Africa. Morocco claims sovereignty over these as they are directly adjacent to Moroccan territory, but Spain maintains its control since the late 1600s, up to today when they are guarded by military garrisons and administered directly by the Spanish central government. Here the matter isn't really independence, but whether or not they will ever return to Moroccan rule. Australia has seven external territories. Under the Australian constitution, the federal parliament has the power to make laws for all territories, including all external ones, and all the populated ones are represented in the parliament. The Keeling Islands voted for integration in 1984, together with Christmas Island, and so they are constitutionally a part of Australia, and independence seems out of the picture. The Heard Island and McDonnell Islands are uninhabited, but some Norfolk Islanders assert that they are not 
not Australian. So I think we can view at least one of these external territories as a colony and potential new country, because two present-day Oceanic countries, Papua New Guinea and Nauru, were administered by the federal government of Australia as external territories as well in the past. So who knows if eventually Norfolk Island won't become its own country as well. Denmark has Greenland and the Faroe Islands, two overseas territories which are self-governing, I guess that's why they don't make it into that UN list, and a part of the Danish realm, being ruled by the Danish ever since they arrived there and established settlements. At least in Greenland, there is a native population which lived there before the Danes arrived. I'm not sure if in Faroe it was the same. The Faroe Islands have home rule and Greenland has an increased self rule, giving it a path towards independence if they choose to hold a referendum for it and it wins. As far as I know, the Faroese do not want independence, so that is how Denmark has managed to keep both these territories at least until now. The Netherlands have six remnants of their colonial empire, Aruba, Bonaire, Curaçao, Saba, St. Eustachius and St. Martin. All of these were part of the old Dutch Caribbean colonies, but the Dutch retained control over them even after their colonial empire was long gone. However, they have different status within the Dutch state. Bonaire, St. Eustachius and Saba are subdivisions of the country of the Netherlands itself. Like the European provinces, they are special municipalities and even vote on European elections, while Aruba, Curaçao and St. Martin are considered separate countries within the Kingdom of the Netherlands. They have their own prime minister and government, so it seems this was the way the Dutch managed to keep these old colonies, by either fully integrating them as part of their nation, or by granting them a high degree of self-rule. France has 11 inhabited overseas territories, French Guiana, French Polynesia, Guadeloupe, Martinique, Mayotte, New Caledonia, Réunion, Saint-Barthélemy, Saint-Martin, shared with the Dutch, St. Martin, Saint-Pierre and Miquelon, and Wallace and Futuna. They make up what is called overseas France and vary in status a lot. Some are called departments, others are collectivities, all being semi-autonomous, except New Caledonia, which is fully autonomous. These are effectively the remnants of the French colonial empire, all of them being islands with the exception of French Guiana and their Antarctic claim too, I guess. As far as I know, any time that one of these locations has had a serious desire and significant movement for independence, the French have agreed to hold a referendum, but in the case of these ones, they have always lost, with the majority of locals preferring to stay under French rule. New Zealand has two associated states, Cook Islands and Niue, as well as a dependent territory, Tokelau. Oh, plus their Ross Dependency Antarctic claim as well. The Ross Dependency has no permanent inhabitants, while Tokelau, the Cook Islands, and Niue have indigenous populations. Tokelau is in that UN list of non-self-governing territories the Cook Islands and Niue are internally self-governing, with New Zealand returning responsibility for defense and most foreign affairs. Their situation seems similar to Australia, both in its origin of inheriting British domains upon independence and also in what the status is now. All are integrated into the New Zealand state, with perhaps the exception of Tokelau, which has less autonomy, but seems to be moving towards free association as well. Norway has two Arctic islands which are technically part of their home territory, but unincorporated, Svalbard and Jan Mayen, but also three dependencies in the South Pole, Peter First Island, Bouvet Island and Queen Maud Land in Antarctica. Queen Maud Land, Bouvet Island and Peter I Island are uninhabited, so it's not hard to maintain control. Jan Mayen also has no permanent population. Svalbard does have just under 3,000 people and only 57% are Norwegian, but since they are technically part of Norway itself, there are no movements for independence. And considering it a colony is a little bit of a far reach. The United Kingdom, the world's largest empire at the time, still remains some of their possessions too, and by far the most on the list. Anguilla, Bermuda, their Antarctic Territory, their Indian Ocean Territory, the British Virgin Islands, Cayman Islands, Falklands slash Malvina Islands, Gibraltar, kind of, Montserrat, the Pitcairn Islands, St. Helena, Ascension and Tristan de Cunha, South Georgia, Turks and Caicos, and their sovereign bases in Cyprus. They are remnants of the British Empire and do not form part of the United Kingdom itself. Many of them have no native settled population, although sometimes because they were kicked out by the British, and a couple are not populated at all. The others have some degree of local government, but follow British rule. In fact, recently, some Caribbean islands have protested against this. One local government even 
even stating, we have said no, we are not doing it, we are not going to take orders from England. It seems during their colonial empire, they held such a tight control over these places that they managed to keep them until now, transferring much of the local autonomy to them. 10 of the territories are listed by the UN Special Committee on Decolonization as non-self-governing territories and therefore seen as possible cases of independence or at least cases where further local autonomy could be granted. And finally, the United States, which also holds several overseas territory, many lasting from the time when American imperialism began. American Samoa, Guam, Northern Mariana Islands, Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. All of these are unincorporated but organized with the exception of American Samoa. Some were taken through war, many of which from Spain and others were bought like the Virgin Islands from Denmark. Each territory is self-governing, including a locally elected governor and a territorial legislator. And while they are represented in Congress, they just have one non-voting member. Other than these territories, the US also has control over small islands in the Pacific, like Baker, Howland, Jarvis, Wake, Navassa, and Midway Islands, the Johnston and Palmyra Atolls, and Kingman Reef. But I think all of these are non-inhabited. So. Why? Why have these specific countries been able to maintain control over these specific territories, while all the others managed to reach independence and no longer be colonies? There are a number of possible reasons. Here are three likely ones. One, the locals just didn't want to be independent. A few of these territories have actually held referendums for independence, which lost, with the people preferring to continue being ruled, even if at a distance, by France or the UK, for instance. New Caledonia, a French overseas territory, voted again in 2020 on whether they wanted to be independent, and the no won with 53% of the votes. Two, the areas are uninhabited and there's no one to claim independence, or they were uninhabited upon discovery, and so the people who live there now are in fact natives of the ruling power. And three, even if the areas do want independence or integration, the controlling state has been effective in suppressing either of those claims. For instance, Puerto Rico has been wanting to be recognized as an official US state for a long time, rather than be independent, but it has not yet been able to because the US won't grant them the recognition. Then we also have to consider other forms of colonization that are more annexation than anything else. For instance, with Tibet or Western Sahara or some Russian incursions in Eastern Europe or the Caucasus region. But those are different because they are directly adjacent to the home territory of those who seek to rule them and do not result of a previous colonial empire, which was the point of this video to find out which countries still have parts of their colonial empire today. The case of colonial claims in Antarctica is also another topic. All of them are frozen, get it, by the Antarctic Treaty. However, if or when this expires, it might open the door for a new era of attempted colonization of this frozen continent over its possible resources and strategic importance. Do you agree with the fact that these places are still under the control of these countries or would you like to see them reach self-government or independence? Many of them seem to be on the path towards it, already having some type of local sovereignty and moving towards becoming their own independent country, Greenland is an example of that. While others seem to be fine as they are, refusing every time they get asked and offered independence. Let me know what you think in the comments as well as any corrections or additional information you might have about these or other modern day colonies. Thanks so much for watching this video, subscribe if you want and I will see you next time for more general knowledge.